Okay. So uh, I'm being told that we can start, but uh, we are uh, right uh, just on time almost. I mean, it's uh, 32. I was going to give it a few more minutes, but it seems we don't need. And there are, I see that we have no, there are some people are coming, still coming in. Uh, we are over 70 participants, so that's good. And people are still coming in. So maybe we give it a couple more minutes and then we start at 35. No, I think, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, now people are coming. Okay, let, let's go ahead. Okay, uh, hello to, uh, to everyone. And uh, thank you all for, for attending uh, this, uh, this session, which I'm sure you won't regret attending actually, because it's a very interesting topic and uh, on a very interesting book. Um, it's uh, actually my, my great pleasure to, to, uh, to be chairing this, uh, this uh, uh, book launch in some form, the launch of a, of a book uh, by uh, someone with whom I worked for, for uh, quite a few years because he, the book is uh, the result of uh, his PhD. It's based on his PhD thesis, which he did uh, at SOAS. Uh, um, and uh, that's uh, Daniel Marveski who is uh, on the screen. And uh, so Daniel did his uh, PhD here in the, in the Department of Development Studies, although his PhD is more in international relations. And uh, uh, um, he then taught, he taught at, at SOAS and also at, uh, at Leeds, at the University of Leeds. He was actually uh, commuting for a while last year, uh, very heroically, because that wasn't very easy. Uh, teaching in both places as an illustration of what it means to be fractional and precarious and all that, as we know, or, or are, 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 <clears throat> as all those who are in higher education know uh, quite well. But this year, uh, Danielle has got uh, a position, uh, although it's a temporary position, but it's a permanent, uh, I mean, it's a full-time term, full, uh, full -time position, sorry, at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, uh, in his teaching there, international relations, and he is, of course, using very much uh, also his knowledge uh, now of uh, of the topic of his thesis and of his book, which is uh, uh, Germany's uh, poli uh, po <coughs> um, I mean, uh, political uh, intervention in the Middle East, and uh, essentially as for the book, the, the German uh, uh, contribution to the um, consolidation, let's put it that way, of the state of Israel and later politics in that, in that regard. So that's a topic which uh, actually has been very little covered. There are very few studies of that. And uh, um, Daniel's book, which I very strongly recommend to uh, every, every listener, or now over 80 person, that's great. Uh, I very much recommend the book and it's the, 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 the as far as I know, at the very least, the only book uh, of, uh, of this uh, size, the only study of this scope that is uh, focused on, on the, uh, the German uh, role in the, uh, towards the state of Israel over uh, that uh, long period with a major focus on the building year, the consolidation years of the state of Israel when Germany played a very major role as Daniel will be telling us. So Daniel uh, will be speaking for, he planned to speak for four, 30 minutes, but uh, I told him that uh, it won't 
nobody will be unhappy if he goes beyond that because our speakers usually speak uh, for these those uh, Tuesday lectures of the SOAS Middle East Institute uh, speak around 40-45 minutes but uh, anyhow uh, that will leave, leave uh, uh, more time for, for discussion and therefore please feel free to uh, post your questions uh, to the, the, the speaker uh, and I will uh, uh, convey them to, to him uh, when the discussion time will be open. Daniel, it's, it's yours. Gilbert, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope everybody can see me and hear me. I mean, due to 2020, I'm used to teaching and talking on Zoom, but it always feels like talking into a void. So if there's any trouble, please um, say so. I remember quite well six years ago or so when I started the PhD, how I was very impressed by the speakers that SOAS invited. And I did not imagine that one day I would be, you know, be on the stage uh, of SOAS. And I certainly did not imagine that this stage would be a thing called Zoom during a global pandemic. So thank you all for, for being here in late 2020. What I will do is I will talk about this book, right? That just got published by Hearst earlier this year. Basically, most books, you can already see half their content, half their argument from the title and the book cover. I think with my book, the whole story is already there in the cover and in the title. So if you look closely, what you see here is the Star of David superimposed on the German flag. And that's actually taken from a mural, uh, from a picture on a remainder, a part of uh, the, 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 the wall, the dividing wall between the two Germanys. So for those who've been to Berlin and who visited um, the East Side Gallery, they will have seen this picture, the gallery between the Ostbahnhof and the Oberbaumbrücke. So that is the cover and the title is Germany and Israel, whitewashing and state building. So the argument is already there and the title it is that initially at its core, we have to understand the relationship between those two countries as one of exchange, an exchange between whitewashing for West Germany and state building for Israel. To put it in more academic terms, it was a question of symbolic state building for Germany and material state building for Israel. Now the book, I mean, as you said, it's based on my PhD, but I promise you it's not uh, written like, like a PhD, or at least I tried. So what I will do in this short talk is uh, three things. First, I will talk about the whitewashing part of the argument. Then I will talk about the state building bit. And then I will briefly go into um, the German role in the Israel-Palestine conflict and how Germany viewed this role. So I will move through the contents of the book, both topically and chronologically. And in doing so, I will focus on the initial period from the post-war till 1967, which is the essential period of German-Israeli relations. This is where most stuff happened. And um, I think this is where and when the relationship was uh, shaped uh, to the present day, in fact. Right, so as you can see from the, the cover or what the cover shows you or tells you is that for Germany, the relationship with Israel is more than just uh, a relationship with any other state. It's more than just based on uh, you know, simple interest. It's much more than that. The relationship with Israel for Germany and especially for the Germany of today is one that really points to the identity of Germany. It has a lot to do with German identity. So in 2018, and this is how I start the book, in 2018, the German parliament celebrated the anniversary um, of Israel, the uh, 70th, yeah. Um, and in celebrating this anniversary, 
um, politicians talked about the relationship and it was quite, quite revealing. And the, the most illustrative quote is maybe from the politician of the Green Party, Katrin göring eckert who said that Israel's right to exist is our own. So she tied the German right to exist as a post-Nazi, post-Shoah state uh, to its relationship with Israel. So for Germany, having this relationship is a way of repudiating, um, of dispelling the, the ghosts of, of the past, right? So for Germany, it's very much about basing itself as a liberal democratic state within the present. Now, what is interesting, if you listen to how German politicians talk about the relationship, is that they always talk about themselves, uh, but they never talk about the actual relationship. So it's a very kind of narcissistic, self-centered uh, type of debate. It's an identity debate, so to say, right? So you never learn anything about the actual historical relationship. And as Jubert was saying, there's actually quite little, uh, you know, writing literature on that. So what's the relationship about and how do you write about this? So my approach was to try to dispel, to try to go beyond the German mythology about this relationship, right? Um, so I tried to look beyond, to look behind um, the German debate because I think it obscures more, more than it shows. So basically the German political or mainstream political, political idea about relations is that they are based on German morality, but that Germany did not play a big role in the Middle East. So that is the mainstream perception a moral role, but no big implications. And I would argue that historically, the opposite or the inverse picture is much closer to the truth, which is that morality had very little to do with the German turn towards Israel. And that Germany has indeed played a pretty big role in the Middle East. So the state building part of the argument refers to what I think is a historical uh, fact that Germany before 1967 was the most important supporter of the Israeli state. And this is the story I tell. I think what people make of this story really depends on their political position as well. So I'm not saying I'm <laughs> uncovering some objective truth here, but I think um, it's a story that can be interpreted in different ways uh, depending on uh, where you stand. Um, and the conflict. Right, so let me go through um, the argument. Let's start with the whitewashing bit. Why whitewashing? Why this term? I mean, if you have an idea of Germany post-1945, both Germanys in fact, but I'm talking about West Germany, it is that it was a moral wasteland, right? Denazification was uh, actually aborted, very early reversed, um, mainly because of the Cold War, because the US needed Germany as a frontline state in the Cold War. So the US, which was the most, um, uh, or the biggest support of denazification, stopped denazification because Germany was needed, right? But this was a Germany that was still full of Nazis, basically, right? So you could not expect a lot of moral repentance um, from that country. So in this context, turning towards the Jewish state in the Middle East was rather convenient for Germany because it could present a liberal and democratic Germany where in fact it could not yet have existed, right? Because of the, the depth actually of, of, of Nazism in German society. So for anybody who has a critical view, and in fact, this is the mainstream historical view, it's not even especially critical, um, the moral argument is, is problematic, right? The moral argument for German Israel relations. I'm not saying that, morally, that morality was absent. Um, it's not, and it became very important later on, 
but initially it was about whitewashing okay and it's not even me who's saying that it is it is konrad adenauer the first german chancellor who is saying that so in the book i'm quoting konrad adenauer who is saying on German television in 1966, the following. So this is Konrad Adenauer, the first German chancellor, right? So I quote Adenauer, he's saying, we had done to the Jews so much injustice, committed such crimes against them, that somehow these had to be expiated or repaired if we were at all to regain our international standing. Furthermore, the power of the Jews, even today, especially in America, should not be underestimated." End of quote. So this is Konrad Adenauer on German TV in 1966, and he's saying two things. First, he's saying that we need to have relations with Israel, we need to pay reparations to regain our international standing, right? So it's about rehabilitation. And secondly, he's giving this bizarre anti-Semitic argument about you know, Jewish power, quote, even today, especially in the US. So what you can see there quite openly is this mixture of the drive for rehabilitation coupled with an overblown idea of Jewish influence in the world and over German affairs, right? So you have this bizarre kind of anti-Semitism as a sort of byproduct um, of this whitewashing, all right? And the book is really full of this stuff, by the way, it is based on research in the German Foreign Office archive. So it is, you know, Gilbert was saying, I wrote it at the Department for Development Studies, but actually it's a political history, right? So it's not even international relations in the sense of IR, but it is international history. It's a kind of historical political analysis based on um, Foreign Office archive material and a lot of other sources. So just a few more examples of this. Um, whitewashing. So um, Germany Israel had military relations from, from a very early stage, right, in the 1950s. And here is Rolf Vogel, who was a journalist and Adenauer confidant. Um, and he's saying in 1966 about German weapon procurements in Israel, he's saying that, I quote, the Uzi in the hand of the German soldier is better than any brochure against anti- Semitism. So he is arguing for military relations um, as a means to combat anti-Semitism in Germany. And to this, Yigal Alon, who was then a Knesset member of the left-leaning Achdut Haboda and later defense minister, said that, well, the Germans have purchased our weapons not because they are good, but because they are Jewish. The Germans desperately need rehabilitation. So I'm showing in the book as well that on the Israeli side, it was fairly clear what Germany was largely about, um, right? So this is important. And also for Israel, turning to Germany was of course in, 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 in many ways the most unnatural um, solution, right? In fact, the relationship with Germany led to the strongest domestic crises in or under Ben-Gurion's um, reign. So I think this is to be out on as well, that uh, you know, for Israel, um, what was kind of expedient on the level of states, obligatory relations was completely um, actually unthinkable on, on individual terms, right? So you have the state, uh, you know, which is hardly nazified, uh, denazified West Germany, and the state um, in which, you know, whose founding populations is made up to one third of uh, Holocaust survivors. So this is really a, 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 a relationship between the two states that would then later impact on the societal level. Right, and this mixture of rehabilitation, whitewashing and anti-Semitism really um, marks the relationship from the German side until the, the late 1960s, right? Which is also, of course, when the, the generation of Nazism was, you know, still um, dominant in, in the German state. 
Right. So I have a few other quotes here, but I just leave them out. I think you get the general idea. And I will move on to the second bit of the argument, which is state building. So as Gilbert was saying, what I'm doing in the book, as well as a bit of Cold War history, a bit of Cold War geopolitics, and also showing in a bit of development studies in showing that Germany was key to the consolidation of Israel in its early phase when the Jewish state was you know, not what it would become after 67 with German help, but in fact a fragile experiment in, in a largely hostile Middle East. So I'm arguing that if you come together the reparations agreement, which was a targeted program of industrial modernization, um, secret financial help and secret military help, what you get is a picture of Germany as the most important supporter to Israel prior to 67. Because for those who know the Middle East history, the US really stepped up or really became the, the crucial ally of Israel after 67, right? And before 67, uh, I'm arguing that it was Germany. Of course, France played a role, but overall Germany was the most important um, supporter of all countries. <clears throat> so, and this was to policymakers at the time that was relatively clear. So Shimon Peres, he would write in 1970, I quote, that the US helped us with money, but not with weapons. France helped us with weapons, but not with money. And Germany could build a bridge over the past by delivering arms without demanding money or anything else. Because so this is Shimon Peres in 1970. Another indication after the 1967 war, which of course changes the landscape of the Middle East in a fundamental way, after this war, the German ambassador to Israel writes to the German foreign minister, I quote, an officer of the general staff told me that the modernized, more heavily armored tanks delivered by us proved their worth in excellent fashion. So what I'm showing here is that, I mean, I'm not a military historian, but if you look at how the 1967 war unfolded, the battle in the air was won with the help of French warplanes and the battle on the ground was actually won with the help of tanks delivered by West Germany. So this is the, the crucial bit of the story, this exchange between whitewashing and state building until 67, which is a lot more complex than it may sound it's a complicated very often strange kind of bizarre history but this is how i try to conceptually understand it right i mean most works on the topic are very descriptive very historical um you know very much in terms of what well, detailed um chronological narratives and i try to understand this historical complexity um in those terms uh, of that exchange so what about the palestinians or what about the israel palestine conflict because of course germany at least by implication uh played a pretty huge role um, in that conflict right and of course within the German government, policymakers were aware of that and they were also aware of arguments made by Palestinian and Arab actors um, that Germany should, um, uh, should uh, or does have a form of indirect responsibility for those who had to make room for the creation of Israel, which is the Palestinians, of course. And Germany knew that. So I'm just quoting um, one of many internal memoranda here, which shows you or gives you that picture very clearly. So this is from within the foreign office in 1968. I quote, 
It has long been argued by the Arab side that Germany bears a special responsibility for the fate of the Palestine refugees. This is supposedly so because of the anti-Jewish politics of Hitler, the subsequent Jewish mass immigration to Palestine, and because of the massive support later extended to Israel by the Federal Republic. Therefore, the federal government is seen to be obliged to pay reparations to the Palestine refugees, similar to how it paid reparations to Israel. It is therefore important to avoid any impression of an acknowledgement of a special German responsibility responsibility towards the Palestine refugees. So it was express policy that a special responsibility, the impression of a special responsibility had to be avoided. So that was kind of the policy um, line when it came to the Palestinians. And whatever was done in favor of Palestinian refugees was done to basically offset or positively influence relations with the Arab states, because both Germany's East and West Germany kind of tried to play um, the Arab states in their German-German game. So whatever Germany did regarding the Palestinians was really a function of its politics towards the Arab states. So this is the picture before 1967. What happens after 67? The first part of the book is really um, about the, the pre-67 period. And then the, the other half of the book is about what happens after. So it's a lot more years in, in, in a much shorter time frame, um, And this is justified by the fact that well, relations were so important prior to 67, but not as much after, right? What happens after 67 is that um, the US, of course, becomes the most important backer of Israel and Germany becomes the uh, second best friend, as it's often called, and um, the, the key Israel ally in Europe. So relations do lose some of their urgency and they do lose some of their drama, but of course they still remain important. And what we see after 67 is something that uh, today seems quite strange if you know, you know the way um, Israel and Palestine are being talked about in Germany. What Germany wanted to do after 67 was to normalize relations. So the thinking was, well, we've done our rehabilitation, now we want to normalize, right? But when they said normalize, it was, it was also often meant or kind of um, um, yeah, what was underlying this was an idea to just, you know, uh, be done, be done with the past. All right. And Israel wanted to retain this special relationship uh, naturally because that was a beneficial relationship and because that is what Israel saw as, you know, being, you know, historically um, 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 the right way. So you, you really have this tug of war between normalization and special relations between the two sides. And the Palestinians and uh, the Arab states play a role in this as well, right? Um, because most of this happens after the oil crisis. Um, and a lot of the moves that European countries made towards the Palestinians were again functions um, of their policies towards Arab countries. So I do talk about that, but I would also argue that despite all this diplomatic friction, um, the material underpinnings remain stable. And I also show that, you know, being the second most important friend, you know, also came with a lot of benefits. So this is the second part of the book. And the third part talks about German-Israeli relations after unification um, or after, you know, West Germany incorporated East Germany. What happened then? What happened then was that the relationship was changed to a certain direction that uh, we still observe today. So at the end of the 1980s, the German uh, president at the time, Richard von Weizsäcker, made a remarkable speech 
in which you said that memory or you know memorizing the past is a source of redemption um, for Germany. So this is where this memory culture that Germany is often applauded for was actually formed. It's it's relatively new. It's a product of, of the 1980s, where memorizing the past. Uh, is seen as something that is quintessential to the German self, to German identity. More than that, it has this religious overtone of um, redemption. And in 2008, Angela Merkel expresses the idea or, you know, formalizes the idea that Israel's security is part of the German Staatsraison, the German reason of state. And these two things go together, of course. So the, the, the change in German memory culture is also seen in how relations um, with Israel are being talked about and are being integrated into this memory culture, right? And this is also where, these, where the, the debate um, about the relationship becomes quite divorced from what is actually happening in the Middle East and from what these relations actually um, look like. So they really become part of the debate of German about over German identity, right? So this debate is very ritualized. Uh, it goes in circles and anybody who knows, um, you know, German discussions about the conflict or about anti-Semitism or how it relates to the Israel-Palestine conflict you know, knows the arguments, knows who exchanges the arguments, and it's always kind of the same uh, kind of discussion, right? But you have this pretty, I think, obvious divide between German debate and German politics um, on the ground. And this divide you can see quite clearly when it comes to the question of the now, of course, long lost Oslo process, two-state solution, and Palestinian state building. So Germany, when, when the Oslo process happened, Germany was very relieved, in fact, uh, and it saw this as, an, as a chance to end, you know, this dilemma between um, supporting Israel, of course, you know, uh, but also being in favor of some form of Palestinian uh, self-determination, right, which had come around to in the 1980s. But the interesting thing is when you look at the, at, you know, how Germany operates in the Oslo process, this is quite different to how this is being talked about in Germany. So before I did uh, the PhD, I was actually working for the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in East Jerusalem, which is a foundation affiliated with the Social Democratic Party in Germany. And what you can see is um, that on the ground, German policymakers and Germans working on the ground were quite were very dissatisfied <laughs> with, with German foreign policy, um, right? Seeing it as throwing money as a process that was leading um, nowhere and as a process of state building, but without a clear definition or idea of where and how this Palestinian state should be created. So Germany has played a pretty important role, I would say, in the Oslo process, but it has not uh, confronted the fact that this process is, you know, long past. And um, the debate in Germany about the Israel-Palestine conflict is quite divorced from what is happening on the ground. So I'm ending the book with a discussion on the emerge or re-emergence of the far right in German politics, how this in some or how the, the far right in Germany when it comes to Israel and Palestine in some ways links back, relates to the early Adenauer years. And I'm ending the book with the statement that Germany seems to continue to contribute to an untenable situation between Israelis and Palestinians, which is a situation it has contributed to in many ways and which I would say have not been talked about enough and I'm hoping that this book is making some kind of start in this direction. 
Right. Thank you very much for listening, Gilbert. I'm hoping this was about 30 minutes. Yeah, I mean, yes, you, 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 you spoke for 30 minutes and maybe a couple more minutes. So mm -hmm. that's uh, uh, great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Daniel, for this uh, kind of summary of the book, which uh, is no excuse for anyone not to read the book itself and not to acquire the book. Uh, uh, I mean, you just got a little flavor of what is in the book. It's uh, a really uh, a very, uh, very interesting, fascinating story. This, this story of the relation between post-Nazi uh, Germany, the Western, Western Germany, of course. Uh, this is uh, just to mention, to, to clarify, it's not about both Germanys, it's about uh, Western Germany's relation to the uh, Israeli uh, uh, state. And uh, so, I mean, that's a very interesting read and uh, also a lot of food of thought, for thought about uh, including ethical issues, a lot of uh, reflections about morality in politics and also the, the hypocrisy, that, of course, that's, uh, let's use the, the, the appropriate term in uh, in international politics so uh, a lot of that in this uh, 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 fascinating read and uh, um, uh, aki has posted on on the chat section uh, some uh, information about discount so how to to get a discount to get the, the book with a discount so please take advantage of it and uh, and order the book and now we have uh, uh, questions this is the the, the, the opening it to, to questions and they are starting to, to uh, arrive. Um, you have a, a first question is about reactions in Germany to your book. Uh, just remind us all, it came out exactly, uh, when was it? In uh, March this in year. March. Yeah, so it's very recent, still very recent for a book. Um, but, and it came out in English, of course. Uh, Daniel is preparing a, a German version of, of his book, which I hope uh, will, will come out any, sometime soon, but that's very important. I believe that uh, this book uh, comes out in German, of course. <coughs> but where the reaction to the, <coughs> to the, the present edition, <coughs> uh, especially that in Germany, uh, English is uh, widely read by, by, at least among intellectuals in the academia. Um, okay, German reactions. Hmm. Yeah, um, I've got, you're pre actually quite good. So I gave a pretty long interview to the the Deutschlandfunk, which is a very important, um, you know, um, uh, radio pro kind of the BBC Four, I think, of, of Germany. That was positive. And then what I find interesting is that the book is being discussed across the political spectrum. Right, so you have conservatives talking about it, and you have left leftists talking about it, which is something that I wanted to achieve. Right, I wanted to prop, well, not problematize. I really wanted to, you know, trouble the whole German conversation um, about the topic. So I think so far fairly positive but I'm still awaiting some reactions. The people who truly are a little bit, um, so to say, pissed off are those who really believe in the moral tale and in the moral self image that Germany tries to create, right? Which I do think is, you know, getting cracks. So if you look at Germany, we have the highest rate of far right crimes in, in Europe. Um, we have a Nazi party in parliament, or at least, you know, in a partially openly fascist party in parliament. Uh, Anti-Semitism on the rise, um, racism on the rise. So this kind of moral self-indulgement, um, I think, is something that needs to be problematized in Germany. It's very important. And, yeah, some people who are wedded to this idea of, you know, the moral... <laughs> reckoning of Germany, um, they are none too happy. But apart from that, so far, surprisingly positive. Right. 
uh, another question relate i mean related to uh, to germany is uh, 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 about uh, i mean someone who traveled there and noticed that there are streets named after israeli figures mm. like ben gurion or rabin mm. and so the question is is this something which is widespread and are there other figures Mm. Uh, uh, used for, uh, in the same way. Mm. Um, yeah, I know which streets uh, you are referring to. Um, there will probably be others. I, the, I think again, the, uh, the thing is, the German perspective is is very oblivious of the Palestinian perspective, right? To say the least. So if in Germany, a street is called after Ben Gurion or Rabin. It's because, you know, this show, you know, this is useful for the German self-image and useful for the picture Germany wants to present, which is, you know, one that has been atoned for. You know, the Jewish state in the Middle East um, is happy to have a relationship with Germany. So that means that Germany has done a great job at mastering its past. This is the kind of function um, this has, and and I think the functions such street street names have have as well, um, right? And there's very little um, critical discussion around that. I think, which is what you would would like to have. Um, but but yeah, this is really about the German portrayal and self self image. It's part of the story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have two two questions. I mean, uh, there may be others. I, I go down the, the scroll down the, the list later, but there are two here which are more or less uh, overlapping. About uh, asking you to to talk more about uh, the shifts in German memory mm. and the the cynical motives behind the uh, the. the Mm. relation of, of uh, federal Germany with, uh, with Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe Let you me can answer this. elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah. The second one, one first, maybe. I think in Israel, the everybody was very clear about the German motivations, right? And um, I, I quoted uh, Yigal Alon, there's other quotes. I think, um, oh, I'm getting coffee, fantastic. I think that uh, Tom Segev in his works, especially the Seventh Million, really elaborates very well on the Israeli perspective um, of Germany, right? which is something I can't go into. I don't speak Hebrew. This, I, this is really about the German side um, of the picture, right? So that was, I think, very much perceived, but the question was one of material need for Israel, right? So there's nothing about atonement or blah, blah, blah. It's about material necessity. Um, so that's that. Then why did it turn into what we have today? Um, where memory culture becomes a source of redemption, right? As in the quote by Weizsäcker. That is a pretty big change, right? The continuity is still that there is you know, a hesitancy to really openly confront a past that almost cannot be confronted, right? So Adorno, he wrote about this in 1959. And he said everything back then that needs to be said about it. Um, I think turning this into a religious source of redemption, this memory culture, is another way of preventing um, an actual, whatever that may be, confrontation with the past. Right. So I think that's maybe even a continuity to the cynical post-war situation. Because as I said, you have this kind of, um, say, liberal... <laughs> We're left liberal consensus about the importance of memorializing and I don't want it's not all bad right I mean you know probably German memory culture you know does have its its benefits um, but I do think the or it certainly does you know it certainly does but the sacralization this religious element is has gone has gone quite far um, recently and I think the question is, well, how does that relate to the conflict? Uh, how does that, I think the quote here, the, the, how does that erase the Palestinian situation? Um, well, I mean, I think the, the whole Palestinian issue really problematizes um, the kind of story Germany likes to tell about itself, right? 
So I think the, the Palestinians as a very significant other to the German Israel relationship uh, problematize the German image, the German idea of this relationship. And this is why they cannot be talked about, right? So it's quite interesting how and, and strange how, well, I mean, it, it even like, like the or, or, or Palestinian narratives of the conflict um, have quite little traction in, in German public discourse, right? Quite little. I think Gilbert, he can, he can tell you more about that. <laughs> he tried his best. Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, there's a, I mean, I will focus for now on the questions related to Germany, which is the, the central topic. And then at the end, we'll take a couple more, more general questions. Uh, related, of course, to the book's topic. Nevertheless, um, there is a question about uh, the uh, German right. I don't know what, what is meant here by right. Is it the conservative or the far right, or maybe both? How do they view Israel? Probably the question would be more about uh, the far right, or I may interpret that in, in this way, mm. uh, because that is less known that, I mean, people I mean, what you tell the, the, what you said to the, the, this evening is about uh, official Germany, let's say. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the Nauer and all that. So that's the, let's say, the mainstream conservative uh, party. But uh, what about this uh, new far right that has emerged that, that, that you yeah. described as fascist? Yeah. The AfD, the Alternative for, for Deutschland. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. How do they, what do they say about Israel? Yeah. Yes. Um, so the, the, I think they are almost comical and very, very transparent. So they have a very obvious tactical philo-Semitism, philo-Zionism. So for the far right, they are hyper supportive of the far right government in Israel. So they are very supportive of the Israeli right, which happens to be in power at the moment. Um, and this is, of course, to deflect from the very real and very obvious anti-Semitism and racism that is constitutive of that party. So that is a very cynical game. The, but the thing about the game or the thing about this tactic is why do they even think it can work? Like, why do they think this could work in German society? And that, I think, is the key problem. Um, the fact that it seems to at least partially work links back to the story I tell, and it links back to the 1950s, where, you know, I was quoting Adenauer, who himself said that we need to pay reparations to regain international standing. Um, so I think the far right, it, in some ways, goes back to the German Germany of the 1950s. And of course, in many ways, it goes back to the Germany of, of the pre-1950s pre as well. But it's a very tactical, um, play and the question is why does this tactic work? I think that is the important question to ask. You you say why you mean it works? Um, partially, I think I, I think a lot of people call the the bullshit so to say, but that they are continuing to do this um, does tell you something. So I think partially, yeah, they're getting away with it, uh, and I think it, this needs to be opposed very much. Um, and whoever cannot see it, I'm, I'm sorry for them. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a, well, let's shift to the opposite side. There's a question about uh, uh, the German uh, left wing. I mean, I presume the, again, not the mainstream Social Democratic Party, but uh, the Linke, the, 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 the more radical, let's say, left, mm. the term is appropriate. And uh, also in that, same context about the anti-Deutsch. Uh, mm -hmm. so there's a specific question uh, yeah. about uh, about them. Right. Maybe so, you can explain yes. who they are because most okay. I mean, not okay. everybody would know what. Yeah, what yeah. So, so firstly, in the book, I don't talk about the German left because it doesn't have any influence on in German policy making. Right. So I don't talk about the radical left. The radical left talks about the radical left, but uh, I talk about the German state. Right. But the German radical left is interesting because it tells you a lot about Germany. So I feel about the, I feel Foucauldian about the German left. You know, Foucault, he went to the mental asylum to study what a society 
understands as normal. And I think if you want to learn something about Germany, you have to look at the debates on, on the German left because they put very clearly what is at stake in the mainstream debate. And the anti-Deutsche, that's a um, kind of a left wing position that emerged uh, after the nationalist euphoria of the 1990s and that you know turned a bit bizarre. So these would be left wing, mostly university related people um, saying that we are against Germany, but very much in favor of Israel, which doesn't make sense logically because I mean, as I show in the book, Germany is a heavy supporter of Israel and has been so from the very beginnings. So it's an illogical position. Yes, it's very illogical. Um, but again, it's a bit like the far right. The fact that this seems to work <laughs> tells you something about Germany, I think. Okay, but uh, you didn't elaborate. It's not very clear what you said about Die Linke. What, what's their position? Uh, you mean, now you mean Die Linke as, you know, not, not the radical fringes, but you, you mean? Yes, yes. The, the mainstream organization yeah, is yeah, yeah. critical okay. of I mean, Israel, well, look, to what extent? Yeah. Yeah, you have the you basically have the choice between Konrad Adenauer and Willy Brandt, right? That is the the post-war choice that you have. Who do you go for? If you go for Adenauer, you go for a position that um, is the one I explained, which is um, rehabilitation, uh, a very clear pro-Israel view, quite a kind of. Um, well, as his biographer says himself, imperial view. Um, on the Middle East, so you would go for that. Willy Brandt, on the other hand, who is, of course, you know, the godfather of social democracy and who is a person, you know, at least I should think, you know, would be good to have in Germany right now. Willy Brandt, he was all very clear about the importance of relations with Israel, but he also was one of the key figures in bringing to light the Palestinian situation and who really made moves of understanding towards the Palestinians, right? So I think these are the two big figures that you have to look at and the social democrats and parts of Die Linke, um, you know, the, I think most of them would work in the Willy Brandt kind of uh, tradition. You have a Willy Brandt center in Jerusalem, actually. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and well, related to that also, there's a question about, I mean, uh, did the... The, the atmosphere, the conditions for the debate about Israel, mm. about the relation of uh, Germany with Israel, uh, has, I mean, has this changed over years uh, and mm. up to, the, to now? Mm. Mm -hmm. Is there more room for, for uh, more, uh, more room for critical views of, of the, the yeah. state? Yeah. I would say, especially under Netanyahu's government. Mm. Mm -hmm. I... <laughs> I think there's no debate about German relations with Israel. There's a lot of debate about Israel and, and you know, by implication about the Palestinians, but there's no debate about the actual relationship. It's really, really funny. So Germany has this massive role in the conflict, but it doesn't talk about that role. It doesn't know much about it, which is why I agree with Gilbert. It would be nice to soon find a German publisher for the book. Um, so no, there is no debate about the German role. It's all projection, it's all about national identity, and it has very little to do with the Middle East. So as regards the atmosphere, I think right now it is very, very charged, right? So Germany has officially uh, condemned uh, BDS as anti-Semitic. It has adopted the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Um, so the, there is, you know, as critical observers would say, um, a, a, a shrinkening of, of space um, uh, for debate. And this also comes with, yeah, and, and this relates to this, um, yeah, ignorance actually of German Israeli relations, you know? Um, so, in a way, I totally ignore German debates about the Middle East because I think they are so surreal. Right. So let's see what my what my book does, um, you know, with, you know, those debates. I'm not sure yet. OK, um, yeah. And you mentioned there was a question about the BDS issue, which you, you just uh, mentioned. 
Uh, one of the questions uh, presupposes that uh, Germany uh, benefited economically from its uh, relations with, uh, with Israel. So how would you react to this? That Germany, um, yeah. okay, I can't see the question. Um, no, don't don't worry. Uh, okay, answer okay. my question. Yeah, 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 don't, right. don't look at the question. Okay, so the Germany benefits. I let you do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you look at the uh, reparations agreement, it was good for Germany economically because reparations were paid in terms of capital goods, machinery, um, ships, uh, stuff like that. So for Germany, it was part of the a small part of the Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle of the post-war years so you know the common idea if you have you know somebody who sinned and somebody um you know who was the victim of that sin is that the sinner repents and pays does something right in the german case what germany did never amounted to never cost much to germany why because after world war ii germany was very quickly on its feet again and israel was that destitute refugee state in the Middle East. So whatever Germany did automatically had a huge impact on Israel. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't take much out of the German pockets, right? Um, so for Germany, yes, there was certainly some material benefit. Also, if you look at military cooperation and, and technology, all of that today. Um, but all in all for Germany, this was more about the whitewashing, more about German identity than about what could what Israel could give Germany materially, right? Um, so it's not a one-way street either way, but for Germany, the material benefits that did accrue were kind of a, a nice side effect, I would say. I hope I understood the question correctly. Right. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, and you, someone wants you to, to, to clarify Probably someone is, uh, seems to be surprised by their, the fact that there were tank deliveries. So yeah. just a question asking you to confirm that mm. uh, this issue. Mm. Well, Maybe you could say more about the kind of weapons or the kind of military yeah. relation yeah, 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 there yeah. was between Western Germany, West Germany, and, and this. Exactly. So I do find military history a bit boring, but it's quite important actually. You know, this is, uh, you know, it's important. So Germany. Yeah, not just tanks, it delivered all kinds of stuff. So boats, helicopters, um, weapons, ammunition, and tanks. Those tanks, or those, you know, the, the, the most important tank delivery was a kind of triangle trade with the US. So prior to 67, the US did not want to openly arm Israel because, you know, of relations with Arab states but it did want to do something. So Germany was partially also pressured to deliver tanks that were actually American. So I'm also talking a lot about the American role, of course, because you cannot talk about German relations without talking about the US. Um, but yeah, just to clarify that question, tanks in the 50s and 60s, absolutely, and much more than that. Okay. Uh, I have now a, a question uh, which I'll read because it's actually a long statement by uh, Professor Smadar Lavi, who is Professor Emerita at University of California at Davis. And uh, she is writing, she says, thank you for your historical political analysis of the Israeli-German relationship. My question or comment has to do with the interplay between German-Israeli international relationships and intra-racial, intra-Jewish relationship inside Israel. I think that these two factors create a pincer that enables Israel's ultranationalism and the continued occupation of Palestine. Mm. West Germany and the State of Israel signed an agreement on 10 September 1952 <clears throat> for West Germany to pay compensatory funds for slave labor and persecution to Jews who survived the Nazi Holocaust. The only Israeli political opposition to this agreement came from the Herut party, which is the precursor of the Likud mm. uh, and was headed by Menachem uh, uh, Begin. Mm. Mm. So <clears throat> Herut believed that it was unfathomable, unfathom I don't know how to say that, to quantify the suffering of Holocaust survivors 
in mm -hmm. German Marx, no less. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. your comment on, on this comment. Yeah, yeah. I actually just read the question and then it goes on to talk about the Mizrahi Jews of uh, Arab origin. Um, and the question then I think turns... No, it's, uh, it's not the one I have. Uh... Ah, okay. It's two different questions. Okay. Actually, yes. I I must say I oh, agree. Yeah, there is a part two later on. That's true. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. let's start with part okay. one. Okay. I think Menachem Begin was right. Uh, he was correct. The question is, what would he have done had he been in power, right? Because Ben Gurion, I don't think he had a rosy image of Germany. He just thought that whatever Germany could give was more important than the moral question, right? For him, the interest of the state overrode the moral question. So the latest book by Tom Segev, who I quote here again, is I think called A State at Any Costs, is a biography of Ben Gurion. And this already tells you everything, right? Ben Gurion wanted the state at any cost, and if that included uh, help from, you know, Germany, okay. Um, so that was Ben Gurion, and uh, Begin had a very clear analysis of uh, Germany, and it had a very clear moral position that the that Jewish suffering, um, that the murder of the Holocaust, should not be quantified in terms of German money, weapons. Or, or capital goods. Yeah, so it's true. Um, and, and this actually goes um, up until the, the 1980s um, when Begin actually becomes uh, prime minister um, that, you know, German relations really suffer. So it's more like the, um, you know, Ben Gurion and Shimon Peres, those figures who were, who were key to this reconciliation process if you want to use that word yeah yeah and uh, the so carry on and now we move to the part two so herut was also concerned by the large income and power gap such as an imbalance influx of funds would create between ashkenazim and mizrahim mm. uh, in the israeli states so on 5th october 52 dov shilansky a member of herut and Holocaust mm. survivor from Lithuania was arrested for attempting to bomb the Israeli foreign ministry in Tel Aviv. Mm. He had walked into the basement of the ministry building carrying a suitcase containing 25 sticks of TNT. His aim was to halt the reparation agreement process. After a two year prison sentence, Shilansky went on to a career in law and politics, rising to the position of Knesset mm. chairman between 88 and 92. He was a fierce advocate for Mizrahi equality and is admired by his Mizrahi communities throughout Israel, Mizrahim or Jews originating in the Arab and Muslim world, and the non Yiddish margins of Europe are 50% of Israel's citizens. And they vote almost in unison for right wing parties, making the center of Israeli politics move toward ultra nationalism. And mm -hmm. the question. Can you please further discuss the electoral power of the Mizrahi majority vote in light of the Israeli-German relationship and the impossibility of any present day just solution for the Israel-Palestine conflict? Mm -hmm. Very broad question. Yeah, I must say it's also a bit out of my expertise, right? Because Israeli domestic politics are not something that I can um, expertly comment upon. I do think that you are talking about a very interesting shift here because it's true. The Israeli right, um, as it derived from Jabotinsky, really was in opposition to any kind of reconciliation process with Germany. Um, and now this changes also as the demographics, the electoral demographics um, change because of course, um, Holocaust survivors and those related to, um, I mean, the majority of the persecution took part in, in Europe. Um, so the, the historical memory was, you know, obviously strongest um, among that um, electoral, electoral group, which was quite divided um, on, on Germany, right? So, Actually, it's a very good question. I think I should think about that a bit more. I just take it, take it up. Um, I think I would just need to think about it a bit more. Um, yeah, 
And you I may, think you, the, the you may write, who asked the question, uh, I think, is, is more knowledgeable yeah. about this than me. So uh, yeah, you, you, you may write, write, turn this uh, discussion around even. It shouldn't be difficult to find uh, Professor Levy's uh, email yeah. address. So yeah. you can carry, carry on, continue the discussion uh, by email. Um, uh, uh, there is a question about how the, the fact that, I mean, how the, 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 this part of the Israeli population, which, whose background is German, mm. how did this, the, this uh, fact affect the, the relationship? Um, or maybe also how, how was it, how is it seen from Germany, which is an, also mm -hmm. an interesting question. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at the negotiations that led up to the reparations agreement, the negotiators on the Israeli side were Germans, German Jews, right? Uh, and the Germans were, of course, Germans, but the Germans who negotiated were not Nazi loyalists, right? So Franz Böhm, Otto Küster, the, the people that now are sent to negotiate with Israel were actually the good kind of Germans, right? So here you had this weird situation where uh, you had people from the um, you know, good part of Germany uh, discussing on behalf of, well, the old Germany. Um, so that was always a thing. And I do think that this cultural affinity language um, shared history did help obviously with negotiations um, with coming to agreements where they would have seemed impossible right so i do agree that this would be a weakness of my book which is a more you know structurally oriented so i'm making this you know kind of broad historical argument but if you look at the more specific um, detailed narrative histories Uh, of German Israeli relations, especially on you know, certain aspects of it, I think you would find a lot of that there where this cultural, this shared heritage um, did lead to an easing um, you know, of, of negotiations. Right. Um, uh, maybe you can also a little bit elaborate on, on that because uh, I mean, in a certain sense, uh, those who are of German background could be uh, the most uh, sensitive to any relation with Germany. Mm. Uh, mm. And uh, so uh, how, how did this part of the population, if you have any knowledge about that, that was not the focus of your research, but mm. Mm. Uh, you, you, you spoke of individuals involved in negotiations, but mm. how about the, 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 you know, the larger population of Germany? Yeah. yeah, I think what we have to see here is that German weapons, German capital, German money, all serve to build the Israeli state, right? But for most Israelis, especially German Israel, you know, German-born Israelis, um, they did not want to have anything to do with Germany. As far as I know, Wagner is still prohibited to be played in Israeli concert halls, right? So you have German submarines, but you don't have Wagner um, music, right? So this idea of not wanting to have anything to do with the Germans was very, very strong, right? So this very obvious cynical state interest came first. Um, what happened on the social, on the societal level came later. And I do think that is a story that is partially um, divorced from the state to state story, right? Um, yeah. Which I think is an important story. Right, and I think the the individual, um, you know, relationship with you know the state to state story is is important. But I think the state to state came first, and for most, for, for basically all Israelis, um, Germany was relations with Germany were a no go. You know, and so as I'm saying, this is really material need on the state level. All right. Uh, there's a, a question which goes back to Germany, which is more your turf. Uh, about uh, the the how how does anti-Muslim racism no. connect with uh, with this whole issue? Uh, and for instance, in the case of the IFD, the far right mm -hmm. support to Israel, is that does this connect to their Islamophobic or anti-Muslim uh, kind of attitude? 
Oh, yes, of course. So for the AfD, for example, they want to uh, get rid of uh, UNRWA, you know, the, the United Nations Agency responsible for Palestinian refugees um, and the far right. They would explain the Israel-Palestine conflict by Palestinian anti-Semitism. So for them, the cause of the conflict is Palestinian anti-Jewish um, sentiment and so on and so on. I mean, you know the, the talking points. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for the far right, anti-Muslim racism, other kinds of racism as well. I mean, also anti-Jewish racism, um, you know, is constitutional, uh, cons constitutive. Um, so, yes, definitely. And on the broader societal level, well, I think the fact that it's fairly easy in German society to not talk about Palestinian viewpoints, Palestinian narratives, does tell you something. It tells you that their perspective, their lives are perhaps less important, um, you know, in comparison. So, yeah, it's, you know, mm. it's there right. for sure. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. It's, it's there for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, I mean, a request that you say more about uh, what happened to the BDS question in, in Germany. Uh -huh. and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as you will have seen, it was when 2018, 19, that BDS was basically outlawed by the German parliament, right, as an anti Semitic um, movement. So, yeah, again, I would say that this is, there hasn't really been a big debate on, you know, you know, the different aspects of BDS. There hasn't been a big debate um, about where it originally came from, but the whole decision was, I think, understood and framed and projected as something that, again, relates to the German self-image as, you know, a country that learned its lesson um, from, from, from the past. So, again, I think the, the, the you know, the well, the outlawing of the BDS movement um, is part of that uh, story. Um, that being said, it's also very obvious that, you know, it's, it's, I think it's almost unavoidable that the idea of boycotting Israel in the context of Germany um, brings back memories of boycotting uh, Jews in Germany, even though, of course, that is not what I reckon most BDS supporters um, would, would want, right? But the historical connection is almost in, inevitable, I think. Okay. Uh, there is a question asking you to, to maybe tell the story of what's going on or what's behind this, uh, the scandal in which Netanyahu is involved concerning mm -hmm. the German submarines. Uh, yeah delivery to Israel. Yeah. There is, <laughs> actually, there's very little talk of this. I'm surprised. I thought it would be yeah, a big story. Maybe you explain the story for those yeah, 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 yeah. So basically, um, I mean, as you know, submarines are a big part or the most obvious part of more recent military relations between the two countries. Um, Israel has enough submarines by military standards, doesn't need uh, you know, a sixth or seventh or eighth German uh, submarine, but still, you know, it is kind of keeping uh, ordering ordering submarines. So there is an issue of corruption involved, obviously, um, between uh, well, Tyson Krupp and and the the Netanyahu office, and this is part of the criticism leveled against Netanyahu in Israel, um, right? But the this controversy itself um, is not debated much in Germany, but I think what it does tell you is that while behind the scenes things are extremely cynical, what it also tells you is that there is this aspect of um, you know corruption and personal politics which really doesn't fit in with the overall grand moral narrative, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yes, uh, 
two more questions I would say, and then we will come to the end of, of this mm -hmm. session. Um, there's one which I'll read uh, because it's uh, factual. It tells also uh, a story that uh, the audience uh, would be interested in. Mm -hmm. That recently the, Will the Willy Brandt Center and the Young Social Democrats, the USOS, uh, were severely attacked by the CDU and FDP politician as anti-Semite since they cooperate mm -hmm. with the Palestinian Party. Yeah. 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 So the, 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 the center cooperates with both sides. The, 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 they have connections with Meretz and uh, young labor and the Israeli young labor, and they try to find possibilities of dialogue. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could elaborate on how you see a human policy about the Palestine question possible in Germany with mm. such distorted discussion about anti-Semitism. Mm. Yeah. And how would you, what would you tell the users? Yeah. I mean, that's my point exactly. Uh, such a policy doesn't seem to be possible when discussions are that distorted, right? And they're immediately drawn to this territory of German identity. So this decision to uh, well, I think reinvigorate really relations with young Fatah was immediately criticized by the Springer press. So it's really the, the right wing Springer press, which is, uh, you know, very, very instrumental uh, in this regard. And you should look at the actual history of, of Springer, which is quite interesting, reintegrated a lot of Nazis into its, 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 its ranks. Yeah. And I think Willy Brandt, he would be, Willy Brandt himself, I think he would be quite embarrassed. I mean, he was the first European politician who along with Bruno Kreisky actually met and sat down with Yassir Arafat uh, to talk about, you know, a possible two-state solution. So for the SPD, Willy Brandt, who had who have been very much, you know, pro-Israel from the beginning. In fact, the SPD was the only party that was unequivocally uh, pro-Israel, I would say for the right reasons. Um, I think Willy Brandt would be really embarrassed if, if you saw this kind of uh, you know uh, debate happening happening today. So yeah, I think it's a very good question, and I do think um, the picture at the moment is, is 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 very negative. It's it's bizarre, it's uh, strange, and um, it's it's a very kind of cynical, very politicized. Um, discussion and my advice to the users would just be to explain the history uh, explain Willy Brandt's actual position explain you know the role of the SPD in the process of relations with Israel which is in many ways a much more positive role than that played um, by the right wing in Germany so yeah my advice to the users is read my book <laughs> Well, <laughs> the, for an author, that's a permanent advice. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah, I mean, I was part of the, you know, Friedrich Hebert shifting, so, you know, I'm not super okay. Good, but uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, to end with a, a general question, which uh, connects with uh, a couple of, of questions that were raised, mm. uh, which both uh, turned out about the issue of reparations. And so, how, uh, how, I mean, would people regard this issue of, of reparations in this case compared to reparations uh, uh, for slavery, you know, the, the issue of uh, reparations mm. uh, for slavery and for colonial rule? Mm, mm, mm. What kind of uh, reflection, if, if there is also, uh, yeah. for yeah. yours or in general? Mm. It's a big question, so I can't really give you a you know satisfactory answer. But uh, you have to remember that the first genocide of the 20th century was the genocide of Germany against um, the Herero and Nama population of today's Namibia, right? And Germany has not paid reparations for that genocide. It has not even completely apologized for it officially, right? So this tells you that Germany has a I think fairly obvious amnesia when it comes to its own colonial history and its own imperial history, um, right? And also, if you look at the reparation history for a Nazi Germany, a lot of victims of Nazi Germany have gone uncompensated till today. You know, so 
you know, Eastern European slaves or, you know, Zwangsarbeiter were compensated only in 2000 when few of them were still alive, but the politically persecuted homosexuals, the Sinti and Roma and so on, they haven't seen anything. So actually the history of German reparations is really, it's a fairly limited one, which I'm also pointing out in the book. And I think one reason why this history today is seen as exceptional in a European context is because Europe does not acknowledge its imperial and colonial crimes, at least not to the extent that Europe would pay reparations. So it's in comparison to this amnesia that Germany is able to look good. Okay, uh, I think uh, we're we're done with the with the key. I mean, with the questions, and the time is is over anyway. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And uh, I should say you have uh, really, you have the added merit of uh, speaking with a huge jet lag. And so yes. you must be extremely tired. So we won't uh, keep you longer than that. Uh, I'm sure you're, you're, you won't uh, be late before sleeping now. And uh, so many, many thanks for this uh, very stimulating, very interesting talk. And I'm sure uh, those uh, who uh, um, listened to it to the end enjoyed it. And uh, uh, well, we, we, we very much wish you uh, to, to, to manage to have a German edition uh, as soon as possible. So maybe ne next year or, or mm. yes, uh, whatever. So many thanks again and thanks to all uh, to, to, to the audience and of course thanks to Aki and uh, Dina and the, the, the organizers of this event for the SOAS Middle East uh, Institute. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Daniel. Brilliant.